Hello. Hi. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to meet all of you, and I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and City Lab for what has so far been a really interesting event um, from my perspective, too. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about what I think could be the future um, beyond just data. And we've heard a lot today about how we can leverage data to make decisions to look in the past, but I want to talk to you about something perhaps a little bit more ambitious, maybe a next step beyond that point. So data is fantastic, right? Um, it's wonderful. And you saw some great examples with Waze and Uber about how we can leverage it to look at what has happened and to extrapolate patterns about what could happen. But there are some decisions, some choices that cities and governments and uh, people that run any kind of infrastructure face every day that are very challenging to make with data alone. And I think some of these choices are really going to define whether cities um, and how well they deal with the massive technological disruptions that are coming. So to give you one example, you know, should we build a road? What will be the immediate consequences to traffic? What will be the secondary consequences to the life of our city? What about the economic consequences? What about the consequences to property prices? These are the sorts of choices and decisions that become very challenging to make with data alone. And I want to talk to you about another idea, one that some of you may have encountered and some of you may not have. And that idea is, is really simulation. Now, the difference between simulation and data is that you actually recreate the thing you're interested in. So I'll talk to you about some examples in traffic, and many of you may have seen you know, models of junctions and roads and rudimentary simulations that can start to show you what happens when people drive through these, uh, you know, these bits of infrastructure. But simulation is really, it's like, um, it's like a model of the planets. It's a way for you to try and imagine what could happen in a number of different circumstances. Everybody here does simulation kind of every day. You imagine how your decision might affect the world, um, or you think about a choice. We want to talk about what that could be like if we applied it at scale using modern technology to cities. So simulation today is kind of what data was five or 10 years ago. Um, it's a cool idea, and there's good technology behind it, but it's very difficult for it to be applied at sufficient scale for it to really be useful. Um, the kind of questions we would love to be able to help you answer are questions like, um, you know, is our policing plan for the Olympics a valid one? Um, if we introduce autonomous vehicles, what could the impact be onto our cities? We can't answer those with, with limited simulations um, that we have today. Um, the area you, you may have encountered simulation today is traffic. And um, to many of you, it, it probably looks, if you've seen modern applications, uh, a little bit like this. So you see a vision of what your infrastructure looks like, and you see items moving around that infrastructure, agents representing cars or representing people. And this is pretty effective because you can try out new road structures or new policy po uh, possibilities and see how those impact the movement of people. And it's great. And in certain industries and certain fields, it's used to great effect. So this is the bit where I want to challenge you all a little bit. What happens if we apply that to everything? Not just traffic, not just uh, things like people and their movements, but to economic activity, to policing, to infrastructure, to power, because the city is all of these things working together. Um, there's a, a little joke um, at my alma mater in the uh, computer science lab at Cambridge, and the joke is that um, you know, cities, cells, and people, what do they all have in common? Um, you have absolutely no idea what they're going to do, and you have absolutely no idea why they do them. And <laughs> that's because they're all complex adaptive systems, and that means that they're hard to understand analytically. But if you build models, if it were possible to really build a model, um, if you will, a practice city, um, for what could happen when we make choices, then we can't see the future, of course, but we can start to change how we think about the information we do have and the choices we are able to make. So bear with me for a moment, and let's imagine what that might look like. So let's say we take our original city model, right? And, and that was cool, that was nice, but let's expand it, you know? Let's have a model, a one-to-one -one model, with several million entities, maybe even hundreds of millions, representing every single piece of transport infrastructure that we have. Every road, every car, every bicycle, everything that we need in order to try and understand the way people get around the city. But let's not stop there. Let's combine that with a model of every single other method of transportation, from tube systems to bus systems to tram systems to everything. And you know, that's pretty cool and pretty impressive. But let's go even further. Let's add in a model of our entire population. Let's use census data, which you have. Let's use analytical models of behavior, which all of your universities and institutions have. Let's use the past data championed by the companies we, we've heard from today and build really good models of population. And let's go even further. Let's add in all the data that information providers um, and 
power companies and other institutions already have access to about all of their infrastructure. And let's put that together with the things we're really interested in, like economic activity, like property prices, like outcomes for people within our cities. And in the end, what we end up with is something really that hasn't existed before, a, a true oracle, a true model of what the infrastructure, people, and systems of a city could be like when they act together. Now, this is a pretty awesome idea, but what's much more interesting is that we kind of need to do this. Um, you know, it might seem like a novelty, but without it, there are certain questions we just can't answer and certain disruptions we simply cannot manage. And I'll give you an example. Autonomous vehicles. Now, let me ask you guys a question, a rhetorical one, of course, but a question. What happens if all of the vehicles in your cities become autonomous? You can't answer that question with data because we have no data. These events have never taken place. We don't know what their impact could be. And what's worse, their impact is more than simply the immediate consequences to traffic. There are so many ways in which these opportunities, um, which seem so exciting, can also cascade into hundreds of challenges. What will this do to the power systems that, that support our cities? What will this do to people whose economic livelihood depends upon uh, these activities? What opportunities will it create for areas of property and areas of the city that have previously been underserved or where driving wasn't convenient? Um, with the kind of simulation we're talking about, we could model autonomous vehicles. We could work with the operators that intend to provide them, and we could actually create laboratories that cities could use in order to try and explore those questions in a proactive way. And I'm talking about more than simply uh, you know, nice visualizations. I mean real hard data being generated by these models that you can incorporate into decisions around how you now design roads, how you now think about regulation and pricing. And what we're finding more and more with the partnerships that we're doing, such as very early ones with uh, the city of Manchester and the government smart mobility catapult, is that more often than not, while cities may lack data, they have a ton of institutional knowledge, a ton of experts, and a great many people that can help build these models in various forms. So let's take another question, pedestrianization. You know, an innocent idea at first, but one that has profound impl implications across cities. Um, especially profound as we think about new builds and new cities across the world and expansions to existing infrastructure. These ideas, again, result in interactions between many different systems and with reactions that take place over a long period of time as well. So the final one that I wanted to kind of throw at you is the big one that um, it often seems cities and governments struggle with. The idea of major infrastructure investment. I mean, often you're talking about tens of billions of dollars being spent on incredibly costly long-term projects. The ability to try and analyze how those will really impact a city and what their consequences might be, and to make those transparent and public with the power of simulation, that could be transformative. That could change how people make decisions, and it could severely reduce wastage and create a better mechanism for partnerships with cities and those that build this infrastructure. So the last thing I want to say is this isn't actually fictional. This can be done today. Um, the challenges are immense. You need to make thousands of machines work together to model massive simulations that would have been computationally unfeasible only a few years ago. But this is being done now. Um, improbable in partnership with, with many other groups and institutions. We've built an operating system called Spatial OS, and right now we're trialing it in use cases um, ranging from transport modeling to economic modeling to other areas as well. This can't be done by us alone. Uh, we need partners now in the form of cities and institutions that are willing to share with us their insight and work with us to help improve their decision-making processes. I want to go a little bit further. I want to make a little bit of a, a kind of a call to arms to cities. Uh, Ride-sharing has disrupted cities, and it has come out of the blue. I think the next 10 to 20 years, we'll see hundreds more disruptions like this, from the sharing economy, from automated infrastructure created by citizens, from the drone uh, revolution that is coming too, um, in areas like package delivery. I want cities to own that disruption. I don't simply want to have them react to it, but I would like them to be able to explore predicting what could happen and to make decisions today that can help mitigate the damage and exploit the opportunity that they create. Lastly, and perhaps this is a little uh, controversial, I actually think this represents a massive financial opportunity to cities. Um, by creating platforms like this in conjunction with technology partners, you have created a massive asset that companies like Uber, Waze, and others are very interested in interfacing with because it gives them the opportunity to leverage the existing infrastructure of the city to help make better decisions about how they organize their own services as well. Cities today are consumers, but I believe they can be providers of valuable resources that can help them profit 
profit from the coming disruption. I also feel that this can create a point of regulation, which in conjunction with our partners, we've seen a great appetite for. Um, if, if cities were in effect an operating system, then through the APIs of that operating system, through the rules of that operating system, you can come to define how you would like to see change evolve within your, uh, within your infrastructure. Um, thank you so much for listening. It's been absolutely fascinating uh, hearing all the talks, and I look forward to meeting any of you um, in the future as well. Thank you.